Uh, social transformation and the role of mm -hmm. education for social transformation. Mm -hmm. To unpack that a little bit, I think it's important to recognize that uh, today educators, educational leaders, families, and, and students are, are subject to a, a radically different set of dynamics than perhaps schools or universities necessarily took into account when we first imagined them, when we first massified them across society. Um, and perhaps it's, a, it's an overdue question to think about do, does social transformation drive an institution like schooling mm -hmm. or an institution like a university? Or is there a role for schooling, for the university, for education broadly mm -hmm. to drive social transformation? And so that's sort of the premise that that we thought would be a fun conversation to have together today. Yeah. Um, before we, we get too deep into that, I wanted to bring up a few biographical things, <laughs> just okay. to, so the people can get to know you. Okay, okay. Um, we mentioned, or Donya mentioned that uh, you went to UCLA for your graduate, graduate training, mm -hmm. making a, a better decision at the graduate level than you had at the undergraduate <laughs> level. <laughs> um, and kindly, we share that background yes. in, in that I Fellow also Bruins. went mm -hmm. to UCLA for, for graduate school. But after graduate school, you made a, a some would we'll call it unique decision. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you went back to teach in, mm -hmm. in K-12 schools. Mm -hmm. Do you mind sharing folks a little bit about sort of why did you make that choice uh, as, a, as a newly minted PhD to, return, to, to move into K-12 schools um, when certainly had been sought after by, by other opportunities at the post-secondary level. Okay, well I did make that choice, but I didn't make it after the PhD. I made it before I finished the PhD. Oh, okay, and actually, thank Actually what happened was, I was telling the group this at lunch, um, I entered the PhD program kind of by accident. Like I didn't really get that, I didn't, you know, I was a working class kid, I didn't understand like advanced degrees, and I didn't quite understand that people getting a PhD were going to go on to be professors. So when I got there, I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like I was just interested in learning the things about mm. cognition, and I, just, and I was interested in education and thinking about thinking and culture, so I wanted to learn the stuff, but I was always a bit ambivalent about the professoring at the end. And I remember getting there and realizing, you know, you're in a space and you're like, oh, wait, like, I, <laughs> these people are invested in a way that I'm not. But I just kind of went along with it. I was like, well, I guess this is, you know, just what we do. Um, and then at the point where I had collected my data dissertation, I mean, my dissertation data, my advisor left UCLA oh, and took a job at another university. I didn't know that. All right. Um, Jeff Sachs, who uh -huh. was amazing. It's amazing, amazing work, amazing advisor. Um, and it, it gave me a chance to um, think a little harder about what I was doing and why I was doing it. So I thought, I'm going to take a little break. And I may or may not finish this dissertation because mm -hmm. I had read that stat that like the average article gets cited by like 1.2 people. And I was like, mm, this doesn't seem very impactful. <laughs> like, this can't be how we're going to change the world. <laughs> like, so I thought, how am I going to change the world? I'm going to go be a teacher. I had uh -huh. not taught before. I had gone straight to grad school from undergrad. I was mm. young. I hadn't, you know, I'd had some experiences, but not. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that before I finished the PhD, if I were going to finish, that I had that experience in K-12 school. And so I went to substitute teach in, in an urban district, district in Inglewood. Mm -hmm. And it was that time, during, it was the time of emergency credentials in California. So I showed up and I was like, I want to be a substitute. And, and the principal was like, would you like a full job? Or would you like to stay here for the rest of the year? And I was like, yes, as a matter of fact, I would. Um, and I, I, I took over a third grade class. Oh, it was wow. maybe a couple months into, this, into the school year. But amazing, amazing experience. And it was everything that I, that I thought it would be in terms mm -hmm. of like what it feels like to be really impactful, to matter to young people, to matter to their days, to push hard on their, their thinking. I learned you, you I, I, I brought in lots of hands-on science experiments. I learned you can't give exacto knives to third graders. <laughs> so I learned it really quickly. I was like, oh, hand me back the knives. We were just like chicken wings. Was, so, so 
some things went well. All we right, planted corn right. in the plot. So a lot of things were great. And then, but, but I also realized why research matters. And it mm. was that I couldn't tell the story of the work. Like I could do the work, but telling the story of it and talking about how we were in this school that was 90% black, 70% foster kids. Mm -hmm. There are no trash cans on the yard at the end of lunch. Like trash was just strewn across because yeah. someone had lit a fire in a trash can five years before and they just took them out. Like Because the, the, the answer is we had one trash right. can fire. We can no longer have trash cans. Right. The cans. answer is dehumanization right. and taking things right. away. Right. And so I, I went back to finish my dissertation with the thought of like, oh, this is why this, pow this is powerful mm -hmm. because you can represent and share the experiences that teachers and, and young people are having that, that's important for folks to know about. Wow, okay. Yeah. What's yeah. interesting to me too, so a few years later when I came to UCLA, I ended up working at the same schools as you mm. had been in when there was a Gear Up project going on mm -hmm. with Dr. Jennifer Obeda, mm -hmm. who had been one of my early advisors and, yeah. and mentors there. And, um, the trash cans had not been returned yet, <laughs> right? Uh, which was noted right. by everybody. And again, yeah. uh, a few more decisions had been made leading to this notion of like, oh, we're, we don't treat students in these schools right. like they, students. Right. Or like, like full like people. Like people. Like yeah. active, agential learners yeah. engaged in activity that is valuable and have something to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. Did that influence sort of any of your early career work post that dissertation then? Did you... Did you bring that into the work as you were designing the next iteration of what you were going to study or the next study that you were going to do? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think so. I mean, the work that I did, the dissertation was about the game of dominoes. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of community-based game in the black community that involves a lot of mathematics and kind of probabilistic thinking. And so my early work was very much about documenting intellectual work that happened in places that people didn't think intellectual work was happening. Right. Um, and and so I had already started to do that work, but then the studies that came after were about identity and the connection between learning and identity. And I think that work in the classroom really impacted my sense that certain aspects of young people's identity show up in school and certain aspects don't. And what does it mean to have environments that spark people to want mm -hmm. to be learners? Mm. Um, and, I, and I kept going back to out-of-school spaces to find the places right. where people wanted to be learners and they could be learners without being experts and they could be learners without taking the same kind of risks you need to take mm. in a classroom to be a learner. Um, but those students, I mean, those students stayed with me. And in fact, um, one of them later came to Cal as an undergraduate. It made me feel old at the time because well, she was a yeah. third grader when she <laughs> had me. She was like, I think you were my third grade teacher. <laughs> I was like, she went on to do it as a things. full adult human yeah. being now, right <laughs> yeah. in front of you. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's because uh, it's fascinating and, and like I think really truthful to your commitment to the humanization of through your work that having seen how schools dehumanize, mm -hmm. you moved your research outside of schools, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it took you to the basketball court. Right. It took you. It took right. you to playgrounds. Mm -hmm. It took you to all sorts of different spaces where your, especially your earliest career work was about mm -hmm. identifying the intellectual work that goes on mm -hmm. in, in the everyday practices as, as folks are learning how to, be, uh, how to be children, how to be a teenager, mm -hmm. how, yeah. how to be a member of their family, how to be mm -hmm. in, the, in the crazy world that they get emplaced in. At what point did you decide that how do I link that back to the systems that produce mm -hmm. people um, and and what did you choose to do about that? Yeah, well, the basketball study had some interesting findings, and mm -hmm. one of the findings of the basketball study was that the young boys that I interviewed were could do sophisticated mathematical thinking when we were talking about basketball, but when I handed a school worksheet on those same things, they kind of folded. And there was one kid that I couldn't get out of my mind who had sat for the interview and I, were, I counterbalanced the order of the, of the task mm -hmm. so that some kids got the basketball questions first and some kids got the school questions first. This kid got the basketball questions first. And he was like, you know, sitting up in his seat, I would say, you know, you're at the free throw line, you take, seven sh you take 11 shots, you make seven, what's your percentage? And he'd say, well, seven out of 11, it's not seven out of 10, so it's not 70%. You took that other one and you missed it, so a little bit less, maybe like 65%, like he's just confident, he's talking about like the concepts, <laughs> the mathematical concepts. And then we finish that part and I hand him the worksheet that has 
seven over 11 equals blank percentage. And he, he did this. He said, oh, you know, I'm not really very good at math. And he said, um, I'm going to go get a pencil. I'll be right back. <laughs> and he never came back. <laughs> But it was the same yes, math, right? Yes. And and I think that came back later because I was like, what is it about school school the school environment for him that didn't allow him to connect with what he already knew? Like it wasn't about the cognition, it wasn't right, about no. the thinking, mm -hmm. it wasn't about the mathematical knowledge. There was a whole other set of things that was about how he thought about himself and what he felt capable to do and then so that era of work where I was really looking at identity in schools was about how do we communicate that to people in school settings like wh where are young people picking up these messages about whether they get to be smart mm. whether they're learners whether they're competent and what is that like offering of identity process look like mm -hmm. so fast forward in the career a bit mm -hmm. you uh, you become more established. You mm -hmm. uh, move over from from the South Bay to the East Bay, mm -hmm. where there's more real right. re when there's more reality going on. Yeah. Um, I was also born in the Bay Area, so I, I'm a little part on the yeah, East Bay. Yeah, I don't Bay. know what the local yeah. corollary would be. But I'm it's trying to like, think about it. Like, well, it's if you're like, from it's like Duke and UNC, like you know, it's like the it's the wealthy like, uh, private place to like. The well, we would say from Ann Arbor to Ipsy, I think, okay. if you wanted there to you get go. to reality, right? Yeah, um, yeah and, like that. <laughs> I mean, I'm willing to put that out there, I think. Um, or, you know, like Boulder to Denver, right? right. You got like a right. bubble space. Right, right. To, uh, uh, this is where like the reality of, of what society does to people emerges mm -hmm. and where you see it, mm -hmm. where you can even trace it earlier before. Yeah. The, it's the preceding indicators, if right. you will, right? Right. I th right. That's how I think about it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, and then, and eventually, because your your reputation gets built up, and people see like, all right, so Naila clearly does like wicked cool research, and and that matters in all these different ways. But Naila is also this thinker <laughs> herself within our organization and her system. Mm -hmm. You get tapped to become a vice chancellor of Right. Equity and inclusion. Yes. Yes. Which <laughs> these are the vice chancellor roles, right? At at esteemed institutions at the University right. of California. We have to. I mean, like, right. yeah. as a man, I'm taught I have to lower my voice right. when I talk about that yeah. level of yeah, a my, position yeah. title. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, <clears throat> so that's a pretty big transition from out there in the field doing ethnographic field work mm -hmm. and working with teams of graduate students right. and and writing up brilliant papers and books and and sharing stories out in, in both academic as well as public settings. And now it's, hey, like lead the university in humanizing people for equity and inclusion. What could you share about <laughs> that? With everybody, yeah. With uh, well, that, I guess you know that yeah. characterization of the transition on my part. Yeah, I mean, I guess first I will share is it wasn't there was there was there were a couple of steps in between, okay. right? Like the so you I didn't was, go from the basketball court to the vice chancellor's office. No, not directly. Um, I was a department chair. Uh huh. I was a department chair in African American Studies at Berkeley, which was amazing. It was a department I had taken classes in as an undergrad that I really really um, treasured. And I, and I only did it because this very wise and wicked man convinced me that if I didn't do it, there would be no department chair. I had no desire for academic mm. leadership. I mean, literally none. Like I always said about myself, I don't, I don't like to be in front. I don't want mm. to express strong opinions and have people disagree. Like that's not what I enjoy <laughs> in life. Like I was like, okay. if I'm throwing a party, like I'm serving the food. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. I'm a, of service contributing member, I'm not like, and especially at the time, and I actually remember when I became department chair, I started a Twitter account, because I was like, I gotta get used to like, saying things, and having strong opinions. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid when you look back at it. Um, so Twitter was your answer. Twitter was. All right. Yeah. Well. Um, but, but what I learned in being a department chair is that I loved helping people do their work better. Like, mm -hmm. my greatest mm -hmm. accomplishment mm -hmm. as department mm -hmm. chair was getting a new copy machine in. 
in the in the lounge because everybody used it. They were grateful every day. Like it really yeah. mattered to people's working lives. Um, <laughs> it really was, and it was cheaper than the old one because we were leasing. It was like the problem solving parts of it. <laughs> anyway. Um, and I learned that you could that it matters at institutions and universities mm -hmm. to have somebody who's looking out for folks, who's thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, what's mm -hmm. the undergraduate experience? Yeah. What are the faculty doing? And the, the other thing that I did because I was broke is <laughs> I became resident faculty in the dorm building, mm -hmm. which was like they give you they sent me this letter and it was right at a point where my husband had quit his job. A lot of my career transitions have to do with my husband quitting a job, but <laughs> they sent this letter that was like, would you be interested in coming and living in the dorm and serving as resident faculty? And at the bottom, it said it was free rent. I mean, would I be in interested Berkeley? in free rent in Berkeley? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I would. <laughs> But that allowed me to really learn the residential yeah. side of campus, mm, like mm -hmm. what was happening in the residence halls, yeah. in the student affairs facing work, and to get to know the administrators and, and other staff on that side. So when the vice chancellor role came up, um, I had both that like student affairs, student services yeah. side of campus and those relationships. Um, I had done some things in athletics because I led this report, so I knew the athletic side and I had good connections with the faculty. So, and I was, you know, in multiple, so it was like, you know, but, but I was, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm sure I was not at all ready for that role. <laughs> it was like terrifying. And I remember calling my daughter and I was like, I'm terrified. Like, I don't know if I can do this. And she was, she was an undergrad at the time. And she said, mommy, if you're not scared, it's not worth it. And uh, I was like, okay, okay. If my daughter mm, says mm -hmm, <laughs> I can, mm -hmm. I can do it. Um, but it was a big transition. It was a big transition during some very heated times. Mm. And um, I just remember like being in a cabinet meeting and some emergency happens and they're like, you have to write the communication to campus. Yeah. I'm like, but I'm in meetings. They're like, we don't care. We need it by two o'clock. Mm. I'd be like trying to double task writing the thing while I'm paying attention in the meeting. And it was just the demands. Yeah. And, you know, it was also during the time of the... Um, the white nationalist speakers on campus, mm -hmm. which was the kind of right wing, like, let's let's see if the, those liberal campuses really stand behind their free speech values and creating these situations where you were like, how do we, mm -hmm. what do we do? Like we do, we're deeply committed to free speech. We want there to be a range of speakers. And, and I had the, like the ACLU calling me like, if you all don't cancel this talk, there would be violence, someone will die. And I was like, oh my oh, God, yeah, somebody's like, gonna die. <laughs> like, and so it was, it was very high stakes. And that's the gravity yeah. of that communication. You're yeah. typing up while carrying on the meeting at the yeah. same time. Yeah, And I also though learned I could um, hold the needs of the students. And I say the students in particular, because the undergrads and the various communities of undergrads had a lot of needs. That was during a period of time when um, BSUs, the black student unions, were making demands on universities and it kind of spread. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and many of them important demands, some of them outrageous demands. And to, to sit with the students and say, okay, these things, I think we can make some headway on these. It's just not going to happen. I need you to work with me. Like, I, I felt like I could um, mediate. And so, I don't know if you know this about me, but I actually started in residence life. Mm -hmm. I did know yeah, that. Yeah, I was yeah. a hall director. Yeah. A couple of decades ago, yeah, um, and uh, and I always have thought like in those experiences you see it all, all of it, and you saw the reality of what it means to that nineteen-year-old who is whose life could be devastated mm -hmm. in the next two or three decisions they're going to make, and how small your class is, yes. in relation to their life, yeah, on campus, how yeah. the the fifty-five minutes that we as a professor have yeah. with them twice a week or, or three times a week mm -hmm. is a, a blip in the radar yeah. of what's going on for them all around. Yeah. And then to, to be in that vice chancellor role, mm -hmm. invested by the institution to, to handle this, but yeah. instead, of handle, instead of treating it as an opportunity to, to handle this, it's as if you, like that through line of the humanization yeah. of, of student bodies, right? comes through in centering, like treating them like real folk mm -hmm. and, and being mm -hmm. candid about like, here's some stuff I think we can do. 
versus I just got to be real with you. Like right. points seven, thirteen, and nineteen are non-starters. Yeah. Like where where can we go from that? Yeah. And but that do you recognize how unique that is in in mm. the broader scheme of how administration around equity and inclusion <clears throat> and diversity and justice has looked over the history of education and and was that at play for you in those moments or is it like sort of on reflection now that you've got some space i mean i think i was just worried i was going to become the vice chancellor like you know right. that it was going to change that your me. voice was going to change yeah, too. yeah that i was and i yeah. never forget so claude Steele was the provost that hired me i had known claude because we were um we were on the faculty together at stanford he's an amazing amazing scholar and higher ed leader yeah. and i and i took the job because it was Claude Steele offering me a job to work with him to do equity work at Berkeley, right? But when, after he appointed me, and we were having our first like kind of check-in, he said, he said, you know, people really like you. I got a lot of very positive emails about this appointment. And I was like, okay, great. He was like, it's not gonna last. <laughs> oh my goodness. He's probably right in some ways. There, there, you know, there was one guy when I was vice chancellor who, wherever I went, he carried a sign protesting me. <laughs> like, in the sign said, uh, Vice Chancellor Nasir doesn't support, and it was like black students, veterans, it was like all the groups, all the groups. <laughs> the LGBTQ students. And, and he just, you know, he, he, he had a personal thing that wasn't actually personal to me, it was about the role. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, he, everywhere I went, he showed up with that sign. <laughs> So I guess it was true. And and then when I left, I saw him on the street when I was back visiting. And he was like, hey, how are you? I heard you left. And I was like, yeah. He was like, we miss you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this was never personal. Like, no, he was just, was he just had you. an agenda yeah. that wasn't about me at all. But I was like, there that guy is with that side. So I did learn what mm -hmm. it meant to mm -hmm. work with opposition. <laughs> well, and you knew you were always in the right place right. if he were yeah. there, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But I didn't answer your question, which was about centering the people. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I do that intuitively, mm -hmm. but I didn't think about it as um, as a unique characteristic. Okay. For me, that's just how you how you move in the world, right? You mm. move in the world in a way that like genuinely connects, that listens to people. I also grew up um, the child of an alcoholic, mm -hmm. and I think that also made me very sensitive to environment and to other people's needs in a way that's been really adaptive career-wise and maybe mm. not in some other places. <laughs> <laughs> that's for the after That's another story for another time. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> well, I mean, that candor is especially appreciated, I think, because one thing I've always appreciated and valued and I think learned from you in some ways is bringing the whole self to the job right in order to yeah. do the job as a whole person mm -hmm. and to see the whole people that we're doing our jobs yeah. with. Yeah. And that that's really important. Not yeah. to say we don't have privacy, not to say we don't keep right. some things that are just right. ours, but or those things that we share with just a few other people. Yeah. But, but you get to be flawed too. Yeah. Right? Right. And, and to share your shortcomings, your missteps, your, because then it gives everybody permission to, not to have excuses, but to, but to be who you are and then to learn and grow, Yeah. right? Because yeah. I think in a lot of places, if you expect yourself to be perfect, then you're actually not recognizing that it's a growth journey all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, there's, people's heads are nodding and mm -hmm. some snaps mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I do want to return to one thing. Okay. You said that you were not comfortable being in the front with the opinion. And I'm still trying to reconcile that personally because the way I that do we love did a stage meet. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's been a quiet day. It seems like there's been some growth in that area. <laughs> and this is in part, so I met Naila later in her career and, and, and in the mid to late, the middle part of mine mm -hmm. thus far. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you already sort of had that microphone. I, I would, su yeah. I would suggest. You, you, uh, that would be true. But you know, it was my staff when I was vice chancellor. Well, actually, mm. I gave a lot of talks as vice chancellor. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I used to, I, I had a fear of public speaking when I was younger. Like, wow. like, this is an embarrassing story, but when I was a graduate student, the first time Chris Gutierrez and Mike Rose made me give a talk in their class, I was so anxious that I had a laughing fit. 
<laughs> and I could, <laughs> I could not stop laughing. It's the worst. Like, if it were been tears, people would have understood. I couldn't stop laughing. It was ridiculous. Like, people were like, what is wrong with her? But it was really just deep. It was deep mm -hmm. nerves. Um, and so I, I trained myself to be able to give academic mm -hmm. talks with a very meticulous routine. Mm -hmm. That I'd write the slides. I would script it out. I would memorize everything on the first wow. slide, the first two or three slides, and everything on the last slide. Because by then, I could get comfortable, and I could go a little okay. bit more mm -hmm. extemporaneous with this. So I had a very careful way I scaffolded myself. And then when I became vice chancellor, I had to give 12 graduation talks and 15 welcomes. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't have time to prepare like I would yeah. normally prepare. I just had to go. And so you met me after that. So I it was did. like, yeah. I could go. Like that job yeah. trained me to like, no, you're OK. You can go on up there and say something that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to touch somebody. That's <laughs> 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 like saying to church, touch somebody. Uh, <laughs> But, but I did, it also shifted, though, my sense of what it meant to speak, mm. like that it mm -hmm. actually meant connecting, not just like giving information. Academics, mm. we speak to give information. Right. But it, often I was speaking, like I remember the, this having to give a talk after the nightclub shooting in Orlando to our LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And like what people needed wasn't information. Like what they needed was to feel seen and to feel heard. And so I had I had developed that muscle. Mm -hmm. I had a there was one one of the talks I most remember from that era. Sonia Sotomayor came to Berkeley because she had a relationship with Melissa um, Murray, who was dean of the law school. Mm -hmm. And Melissa came to the equity office and was like, "Hey, I can bring Sonia Sotomayor. I clerked for her. Would you co-sponsor this talk with me?" I was like, "Absolutely." Mm -hmm. And I had the best executive assistant in the business because she started negotiating behind the scenes with Melissa's office to say, Naila's going to do the introduction. Oh. So I used to wear the, I had these red shoes I used to wear. I, I, started, I started wearing heels when I became chair, and they just got higher and higher as I was vice <laughs> chancellor. I just haven't come back to them after the pandemic. But I had these red heels. And my EA, my executive assistant, the day of the event, moved the podium from where I would walk up and be close to it to where I would walk up and walk entirely across the stage because she wanted to see those red shoes <laughs> walk all the way across. And if you watch the video, you will see it's a long walk across. So the staff kind of pro propped me up. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> your team matters, they, right? They matter. Yeah, your they, team they were, matters. It was an amazing team. It was an amazing That's fantastic. Team. Yeah. I love that. So. I'm trying to think about where to head head next here, but well, I do want to touch on your AERA talk. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're president, when you serve as president of AERA, you give what is largely, I think, perceived to be like the most important talk of the entire conference, right? It's a, it is a mm -hmm. moment. It's a moment. And each president gets to sort of design that moment as as you see fit. You have some say, I presume, at least, about where in the program it is and. I mean, a little bit. Kind of. Yeah, so. I mean, no. <laughs> you all know Felice Levine. Or you're just thrown to the wolves. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, maybe you could push back if you if you had the courage and tenacity. But <laughs> basically, uh, you're told what to do. Okay. But, yeah. but you do get to decide the, the, the topic. Yes. You get to yes. decide how much to do on what dimensions of mm -hmm. the top and whatnot. And, and you, um, in your talk, you did a little bit of you mm -hmm. in the sense of grounding this and sort of why are you interested in this topic right. but then you really move to in us i mean i'm not going to quote or paraphrase anything just what i took away from mm -hmm. it was how do we make what we do matter yeah and that the the call really for education research which is what aera is all about which is what spencer is charged with mm -hmm. supporting and funding mm -hmm. how do we make research about education matter, and matter in the mattering, if that can be a thing, uh, in the process of it, as well as in the, the outcome mm -hmm. from it, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like, for me, sitting in the audience at that time, I don't know if anybody else in the room was, was there in San Diego. Uh, was that just last year? It was. Just last year. Yeah. 20, about 20, a year ago, two. almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next month. Yep. Um, and... And thinking about, so this rings true for I think a lot of folks who have, what Naila was sharing about how to make work 
educational research matter or matter for matter aim must have felt like it rang true for a lot of us who have ever felt that we were not the mainstream of education yeah. research whether because of identities that we bring along with us mm -hmm. to the work or because of the way in which we choose to pursue the work or because the consequence of the work comes first for some folks rather than the, the, the initiation or the question to the work, which doesn't mean the questions aren't inconsequential. But can you share a little bit a bit about now that you, at that point in time, you have found your microphone mm. and you don't have to lower your voice to be right. the vice chancellor right. to have something to say, and you have a platform of all of AERA and you're, direct, you're, you're presiding over what some would argue is one of the most influential uh, financial supporters and thought partners with the field, how did the decision come about to say use that moment to, to push back on this mm -hmm. particular topic and, and what does that mean for how research or how education might transform other societal problems yeah. that we wrestle mm -hmm. with? Yeah. Yeah, I agonized over this talk and it was like I wanted to be AERA president once they convinced me because um, you know the way it works, right? Like somebody calls you and they say, hey, you got nominated. Would you be willing, you don't have to do it, but would you be willing just to let us put your name on the ballot? And I was like, sure, she could put my name. And, it was, and the person who called me was Deborah. Um, Lowenthal? No. Yeah, Ball, Deborah Ball. Deborah Lowenthal Ball. Ball. <laughs> Deborah Ball, who, who was the chair of the board at Spencer when I got hired. So I couldn't say no because it was Deborah, and she actually said to me, "Please don't make me go back and tell the committee you, I failed." <laughs> and I was like, "Well, dang, Whoa. like I can't." So I was like, "Sure, you can put me on the ballot." In my head, I was like, "I'm never going to win, so that's great. I can just say yes to Deborah, and I could lose this election, mm -hmm. and that would mm -hmm. be amazing because you know that's a lot of work." And, you and then they busy. call you, and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> "You're the new president of ARA." You're like, "Oh Lord." Um, but, but I got into it because I was like, the, the thing the president gets to do is create a presidential program, which I don't know why, you all may know this already, I didn't understand how it worked. So there's like the whole AERA program and then there's a presidential program that kind of sits mm -hmm. within it and it's like 40 sessions, you get to design, invite people to, you write a call, people submit to the presidential program. Like a conference within the conference yes, in a sense, yes, right? Yes, but it's such a fun opportunity to pull together conversations. Mm -hmm. That was super appealing, but I was like, but I'm gonna have to give this talk. Because it was the only part of it that I was like terrified of. Really? Oh, because mind you, I had been, I had been vice chancellor for two years. I had been at Spencer for three or four years. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, like, I'm not even a scholar anymore. Like, what do I, I, I worked on this handbook. Like, maybe I could pull on that. Like, I don't have anything, I have no new data. Okay, like, okay. I don't have anything new to say. And anything I've said, people have already read it because I've already written it. So I was feeling anxious about that, like self-conscious about it. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, but maybe you can speak from what you, the work you're doing now and mm -hmm. what you do know, which mm -hmm. is why I made the pivot to like, okay, here's some things we know about learning. Because the talk had three, three main parts. It was, what is learning? What do we know about learning? If we were in, and that learning is inherently cultural, it's socially constructed, it's, it's, it's work we do together interactionally. And then if we took this seriously about learning, what kind of schools would we build? And there I was drawing on you know, Linda Darling Hammond's work and, and other folks. And then the third part was, and if, and if we took our obligation to creating learning systems seriously, what would our research be? What would our, what would our education research look like if we wanted to build those kinds of systems? And so, um, so I felt like in some ways it got to mirror the arc of like Your cur my yeah, career. Yeah. Um, and I was just glad it didn't, it wasn't a major flop. Like I was, <laughs> they, they invited my, uh, my sister to do part of the, the introduction, which I, know, I didn't know they, I didn't know they had done that. My sister got up there and started telling stories. I was like, what is she going to say? <laughs> like she told a story about me hitting some kid with a shoe, she defending did. her. Like it was, so there were some surprises. Um, <laughs> But, um, and I thought I was going to throw up before 
before the talk, and I didn't want anybody to talk to me. I was like so mean and antisocial. And I don't know if you like, remember. Do you I, I saw like, no, you in the hallway, like I think forty-five minutes before, and you were with your daughter. Right. And you're like, oh, do you remember? I was like, I don't know. And you asked me like one question, and it was clear you wanted one answer. Right. And then to move along, and right. I was like, all right, I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna give you your time. <laughs> I did that to a number of people. <laughs> and then you're in there, and your family comes up and and, yeah. and talks about you throwing the shoe and hitting some kid in defense of your. Right. Sister, right? right, and I it was such a beautiful moment when you come to the mic and you say, Leave it to your family to make you cry right, right before the biggest <laughs> talk in your career. Right. Which instantly, I think, signaled to anybody who, who didn't at that point in time already know you that this is going to be a talk that's going to be about humanizing, yeah. that's going to be yeah. about building things that take very, very seriously our obligation to make more fully human yeah. through the work that we do, yeah. the people that we're honored in our call mm -hmm. to serve. But here's what's crazy, is the talk struck a nerve. Mm -hmm. And people were writing me like, that was the best ARA presidential talk. Mm -hmm. And then people who weren't in the academy, but who were like, you know, policy folks mm -hmm. or foundation peers were like, okay, but what are you gonna do now to move things in that direction? And I was like, oh, yeah, I run a foundation that <laughs> yeah. funds education research. Uh -huh. I guess we could actually do something about these problems that I'm describing. And, and the problems were talking about education research being siloed, that our outcomes are about academic papers and academic journals and not we're not held accountable to change the world. We're not held accountable to make education systems better. Mm -hmm. Um, we're not, we don't put equity at the center of our work, mm -hmm. either in, in what we're after and in how we do our work, despite the fact that we know social inequality plays out in education systems and reproduces itself again and again. Um, so, so I had kind of, without knowing it, laid out these critiques mm -hmm. that then became, like at Spencer, like, okay, we get to do something. What does that look like? And that's been really, really exciting. So I'm glad you bring that up, because I'd love to hear more the role that philanthropy can play. Mm -hmm in supporting education for social transformation mm -hmm. and and your time at the foundation thus far because um, i joined you and, and we got to work together mm -hmm. Naila invited me year. to come and hang out yeah, yeah for <laughs> a few long stretches of time and the i understood the agenda at that point in time mm -hmm. is let's let's build let's let's revise practices enough so that the foundation can be more responsive yeah. to the field Mm -hmm. uh, so that it, it has a, a service call or dimension mm -hmm. to it, in a sense, to the researchers that make up education research yeah. communities. And, and it seems as though post the talk, and perhaps this was all just bubbling up from doing mm -hmm. the, the let's be responsive work, there's a, a, a different pivot, in a sense, to what is the role of philanthropy in in impact yeah. of education yeah. research. Yeah. Yeah. But if you remember, is that fair? Is that's that... fair, absolutely. But that came up, I mean, what we did together was basically a listening tour yeah. with the field. Mm -hmm. and, and we together kind of with our staff outlined the, the findings. Rock star team. I mean, amazing. I mean, <laughs> some good times. Um, and, and then shared out that, like, yeah. here's what we heard, right? Yeah. So it was yeah. like, and we asked, three questions in those listening sessions. And we did 40 schools of ed all across the country. Mm -hmm. We asked, um, what is the work that's most exciting to you right now? What, is, what do you need to be able to do your work better? Mm -hmm. And kind of what do you think the field should be doing that it's not doing yet? Or something like that. What do you, what do you want for your work? There was some type of future looking question. Of whom did you ask the questions? Faculty, scholars, scholars across. Um, institutions and different types of institutions right. and one of the things we heard was people wanted their work to matter yeah. and we heard this a, a lot from younger scholars but really from across the field and people were you know it was the, during the the Trump era and people were kind of hand-wringing about and Trump didn't create social inequality but certainly um, it got worse but people were worried about what does it mean to be an education researcher in an era mm -hmm. where it doesn't seem like our findings, our data, what we know about education is getting lived in mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it feels like we are regressing as a country around our commitment to equity. And 
And there were other things. We heard lots of we things. We heard a lot of things. And um, then brought those to mm -hmm. uh, other groups, too, that we then brought mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And started thinking, what are, what are things along the contours of the foundation to do? So piloted a couple programs, yep. thought things a little mm -hmm. differently. We did. Some processes. Yeah, I forgot about the, that. Yeah, we I did. mean, some yeah. of them worked, and some of them I noticed are no longer happening, and that's how things happen. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but even in those groups, uh, uh, this notion of mattering seemed to really come back yeah. and people struggling yeah. to know how do yeah. I do that. Yeah. But we hadn't done anything about that piece. The piece we went in on for the first five years was making the organization itself transparent yeah. and accessible. I told the story in the lunch group like when I first got there, um, Spencer staff would stay in an off-site hotel at AERA. Mm. Do you, you remember this? I you remember, were there, yeah. I, well, and it was a nice hotel. Right. Was, but when I was like, okay, but why do we do that? They were like, well, we do that because if we go to the conference hotel, people ask us questions. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, I it's feel like, like we like the professor who's like, if I hold office hours right. in my office, students <laughs> right. might find me, right? right? Like, exactly. Or the dean who is like, well, if I have the leadership team meeting in the conference room, people will know where to go. Right, like, <laughs> right. So, so... So, so a lot of that work in the first few years was how do we make it less of a black box? Mm. Like people, Spencer yeah. has a, a mystique and yeah. an aura and it's like for those other people that are somehow in the Spencer family that's not me, like how do we message no everybody? Yeah. Like we want to hold the whole field. We want a range of institutions represented in our funding cohorts. We want young scholars doing amazing work. We don't just want the same cast of characters who mm -hmm. come again and again. So it was, it was messaging that breath. And then moving from funding things that were beautifully designed, beautifully designed research that doesn't matter to the world, <laughs> <laughs> to thinking more about what's the work that matters to the world. And so we started some, some programs uh, along those lines a bit and like tinkered with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, then, and we built a new organization. Spencer is not the place it was. The staff are diverse and vibrant. It is not the yeah. sleepy place it was when you joined me there. <laughs> it is it's alive. It's very quiet around 4 o'clock. Oh, my you goodness. You could take it's a still, nap and not worry about Yeah, they, they do still leave at 4 o'clock. Oh, well, That's a foundation yeah. thing that okay. <laughs> you can't. But, um, but the, the board is more diverse. Yes. The board really has come a very long way around. I mean, I mean, they hired me, so they knew what they wanted, yeah, right? They yeah. wanted the organization to hold more of the field. Um, but then there were reports where um, we had to come to alignment <laughs> <laughs> through a process. Um, and we did things like, you know, change the review process so that who mm -hmm. we were funding was more representative across the field. Yeah, and we, and, we, yeah. and we, we now do an annual report where we track that and we share it and we show how well we're doing. Um, we um, thought a lot about our review process mm -hmm. and we did things like move to having 100% of grants that come in the door get feedback rather than just if it used to be if you made it to the top 30% you'd get feedback. Mm -hmm. But if you were, so we meant that those furthest from getting it right got the least information about what they got wrong, yeah. right? So we moved to, we want everyone who sends in a grant to get feedback. And we didn't know how we were gonna do that when we, when we right. first started talking about that. Like, and we were like, ah, it's gonna be expensive, it's gonna be, but. And you remain unique in that. There, you do not get feedback yeah. from, I'm, I mean, my brain is rattling about any other sort of open, at least from open call opportunities. Right. right. You know, because so. there's a volume issue. Well, yeah, right? I mean, you get it. <laughs> yes, I remember staying yes. up late after four o'clock, reading, reading proposals, proposals yeah. and mm -hmm. find, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So, yeah. So, so I felt like we we and then when um, 2020 hit yeah. with the pandemic, that that I think it increased everybody's awareness of the social inequality in mm -hmm. education and how different. Families and communities were being positioned so differently with yeah. respect to educational resources. And being and slapped in the remote. face. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then the George Floyd murder with the mm -hmm. na national and international protests around race. Um, we just became more and more, I think, aware of what our role could be. And, and then post the AERA talk, that was like my own mm. call to action. Like, you know, we do, the president of Spencer does five-year terms. When your term is over, either the board invites you to leave or the board invites you to stay. Um, and I didn't want to do a second term unless I had like 
a mission about it, unless mm -hmm. it was something really I was after. I didn't want to just like, because it's a place you could get sleepy and you can just kind of be in the seat and decide some things and like I didn't want to be that. Mm -hmm. um, so my mission became that, like how That's do we cool. do a better job of supporting a transformation in the field around how research happens and what its aims are in education. So that's kind of what we're after in this next era. We have some announcements coming All right. at AERA about a couple of new programs that are after that, that are about how do we support people to do research that is more deeply collaborative, where you mm -hmm. have time to plan together because mm -hmm. you're working collaboratively across disciplinary lines, across stakeholder groups. How do we make sure that research happens with real folks at the table, uh -huh. real communities, real young people, real teachers, real district leaders, real policy makers, so that it takes up the problems and challenges that the world needs us to take up? Mm -hmm. And how do we set more ambitious aims? How do we make systemic change in the direction of equity? So that's what we're, that's what we're after in this era. It's so, so exciting. Y'all heard that here, this work. right? A little preview. <laughs> A little yeah. preview right here today. Yeah. Now I, I want to get. I want to make sure because I'm sure there's a lot of thoughts going on mm -hmm. across the audience to so have some time for Q and A. But I, I do want to. I, I want to ask one more sort of round of, of stuff here, because mm -hmm. we here at EMU, um, particularly in the College of Education, where we're quite proud of our our legacy of leadership around education and educator preparation in the state, um, as the first normal school as uh, the College of Ed with, more, oh, thank you, Fred. Mm -hmm. I'm the host and she's <laughs> pouring my wine. Uh, as the College of Ed with the most alumni working in public education across the state. Mm -hmm. um, but we are quite proud of our ethic around engagement mm -hmm. and our ethic around uh, what does it mean to be community involved, but also com allow, not, not allowing in the sense of uh, we need to, to give permission to but allowing in the sense of ignoring what the broader institutional presses might suggest mm -hmm. ourselves to be community driven, in fact. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think we're doing some things internally to make sure that while the institution might not be set up that way, because mm -hmm. we're still as an institution, as most universities are wrestling with these centuries of how we were set up to be other than. Mm -hmm. But in the College of Ed, I, I, I believe in part of what's attractive about Eastern is our commitment to these ethics of community engagement, community involvement, community first, if you will. And um, for us, that means doing work that has uh, application, mm -hmm. doing work that blurs lines across outreach, research, and practice in, in ways that can integrate into a new volume of scholarship, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I offer you that as background for what I'm really curious about. Um, what then do you see as the role for colleges of education mm -hmm. and for educator preparation, educator broadly mm -hmm. conceived from the special educator to the uh, curriculum specialist to the, the, the building leader to the, the clinician working in speech and language with folk with with young with mm -hmm. young people and families um, what what role do you hope or would and I'm not going to ask you what would the foundation support but mm -hmm. would be in line with this new vision mm -hmm. uh, this this renewed vision yeah. of the foundation's leadership here uh, play in transforming society through these efforts. What, mm -hmm. what thoughts do you have about yeah. the role for colleges of ed and ed prep? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think both are super important. And if we imagine a world where education research isn't done just by scholars in their labs, right? If we imagine a world right. where education research is collaborative with district leaders, with teachers, with families, with communities, with young people, then there's some capacity that educators need to engage that mm -hmm. well too. Like there's yeah. clearly some capacity researchers need to learn what power sharing <laughs> looks like <laughs> and what deep, true collaboration looks like. Yeah. Um, but I think it has implications for training on a number of dimensions. It certainly has implications for how we train 
education researchers, mm -hmm. but I think it also has implications for how we train clinicians and practitioners and school leaders and teachers. Um, and we were talking about this a bit in the in the lunch session um, mm -hmm. about pro. We, we talked specifically about Mills College, which had such a legacy mm -hmm. of training teacher scholars. Right. But that idea of teacher scholars, of practitioner scholars, is really really important then. Because what you're after is shifting the whole ecology. And ed schools are kind of at the center yeah. of that ecology. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's promise in that, in sort of an, a mutual empowerment to address, like right now today, educators are getting beat up right and left mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. mentioning race in the mm -hmm. classroom, mm -hmm. for suggesting mm -hmm. that gay kids and trans kids mm -hmm. have something valuable to offer their right. friends and need mm -hmm. to be feel safe in school if nowhere else um, our educators and, and leaders are being literally beat up but also mm -hmm. beat up in the press and in yeah. legislation around all sorts of pieces of that are all tied to inequalities that we can trace and have traced for decades mm -hmm. right but is there is is there an opportunity of empowerment in that notion of capacity building for educational researchers for professors for faculty mm -hmm. and capacity building in the preparation of who become teacher scholars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is there a, an, an interstice there that we can try to excavate? And a what? An interstice. <laughs> is there a fractured, <laughs> is there an opening? Is there a space, an open okay. space gotcha. to be filled? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where that could, uh, does that hold any promise to help equip ourselves for battles ahead, I guess? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I or am I, I think, romanticizing no, it? No, I think like, so. I think that's fair. I think, I, so one of the things I've been pondering a lot is, is in this era where it's so clear that our systems across the board aren't getting us to where we want them to be, right? Whether that be our teacher education systems, our schooling systems, our funding systems, like our systems aren't getting us to be the kind of even-handed ecumenical society in which everyone's potential gets fully developed and they're able to thrive. Like we are, we, we, we agree we're kind of missing the mark there. Yeah, yeah. So if that's true, then part of our work has to be to envision new systems. It has mm -hmm. to be to, to start with possibility. And, and I've been saying like if, if scholars can't do that, we get paid to think. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. If we that's can't pushy. figure out <laughs> how to center like innovative thinking rooted in possibility and hope, then who, who? <laughs> and, and, and I guess I would extend that in, in some ways to thinking about scholars in community with educators, right? Because it's also not too viable to be reinventing stuff that you're not at the ground floor of to right. begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so who are we reinventing? Who are we reimagining with? Mm -hmm. And, and I think there is possibility there. And I think we yeah. have to like embrace that possibility. And people have said, well, you know, is it, this idea of reimagining is so idealistic. Like it's so kind of Pollyanna-ish. I worry. Right? But then I think about like, I'm, I'm, I'm African-American in this country. My ancestors came here as enslaved people who hoped and dreamed mm -hmm. of freedom for generations yeah. before it happened. So like I think we can do it. <laughs> like I think we can imagine the thing that don't that don't the things that don't seem possible now is like planting seeds for what becomes possible in the mm -hmm. future. And I think in our, even in our lifetime we've seen that happen. Yeah. 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 Beautiful.